How many are glad you came this morning? Not only am I glad that I came, I'm glad the Lord showed up. If he didn't show up, we might as well not even come at all. Now, the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing with a kingdom paradigm of reality. And I think we need to kind of return to it and understanding how some things operate. How many of us have seen people around us that really aren't functioning in reality at all? You just kind of wonder what planet they're on sometimes. One of the realities that I want to deal with this morning is of the Spirit. Last week, we dealt with how sin can darken and deafen our spirits that we can't hear God. One of the things that we, uh, because I want to do a contrast this morning, how many know that evil never sleeps? It never sleeps. The way we have seen over the, in, in my lifetime, how many know in the 60s it was a radical time? And education and society uh, was pushing things beyond the limits. I remember hearing back in the 60s and 70s, and, and actually they've kind of renamed some of this stuff today, that they're, they're teaching classes on business for women that they're basically teaching them how to function in witchcraft. That had its birth in the 60s. They even had human sexuality classes to where they had people engaging in it on display live in the classroom during the 60s. How I many know every crazy thing that could have happened happened in the 60s? And it was in education that it was displayed. It was in, in society. Everything was, socialism was about to take over. But there's sometimes the devil overplays his hands that he pushed people so far from God that he pushed them into God. And a revival broke out. And things kind of quieted down. But it didn't go away. How I many of the spirits of Babylon are still alive and well on the earth? And we're seeing them begin to wake. I just want to take some headlines from this week. Now, we have been dealing a lot with uh, the, the gay and lesbian agenda because laws are being passed right now. We have a photo uh, company that were Christians that refused to do a photo op. You know, we, it used to be in America you could refuse service to anybody. And I see restaurants like that. You know, they, they, you can't anymore. They were sued and fined all the way to the Supreme Court in that state. We're seeing the same thing with, with caterers. And guys, it's going to be coming very shortly that I don't think ministers are probably going to perform wedding ceremonies anymore because if they do, they've got to perform them for everybody. But remember me telling you here a few years back, and some of you may have been prior to you guys coming, that I said as this goes on, the same tactics that the gay and lesbian community, 4%, is changing the way 96% of us live that there is a 1%, the pedophiles, that are going to use the exact same agenda to push their stuff. How many have heard of something called Common Core? Also known as the Common Whore. Because it's from Babylon itself. And in at 12th grade within Common Core curriculum, students are required to read. Now this guy is a, a Nobel laureate. He writes so well that the Nobel Committee gave him a prize, and so what he has done, he has taken that extreme literary talent, and he has written porn. Not only pornography, oh, it's a woman, writes about a pedophile abusing a child from a pedophile's point of view. It's required reading in the common core that's being promoted right now. Students that refuse, we, we can't do this. This is morally objective to us. They were taken out of the class, not for that day, but for three and a half weeks because that's how long they dealt with it. They, they tried to normalize the perverse. You see, not only is that going to happen, but one of these days people are going to be marrying their farm animals. Yeah. It's coming. It's coming. Did you know right now there's some legislation trying to be passed in some states that if you don't treat your dog right, your dog should have, be able to have counsel and to sue you for not taking care of it right. You didn't give it enough treats. And it didn't like those milk bone treats. It wanted the, the pedigree treats, and it's going to be able to sue you. Now, how that can be communicated, I don't know. They're trying to normalize darkness. When, when darkness is exposed, it doesn't go away it goes into the background, 
and it begins to seep and get allies. It begins to work in an undercurrent. It's almost like people are finding out they have these beautiful homes, and once you, you move into it, it's toxic, and you find out there's black mold in all the walls. You couldn't see it. It was in the background. But many times, once it's exposed, it's kind of too late. Well, Mike, I just don't know if that's really going on in the school systems. Here is a teacher that sexually abused an eighth grader that the teachers in the school stood with him. Oh, well, the child could have stopped it at any time, you know. The child really wanted it. He's really a good teacher. Kind of makes you, and this is just, just a couple of things out of the headlines. There, every once in a while, there's, there's a news cycle during the week that I almost get overwhelmed. There's so many things coming out in America and around the world that one person cannot uh, ferret through all the information and, and try to get a handle on everything. It's too much. Darkness is being loosed around the world in an unprecedented wait, right. wait. Oh, that silly wabbit. We'll get by this here in a minute. But God had me begin to deal and to begin to speak to me that one of the reasons this is happening is the body of Christ is spiritually asleep. And our spirits have fallen asleep. I want to look at some scriptures. Now here is out of Isaiah 56, 10 and 11. His watchmen are blind. How many know that's a bad place to be? And they are all ignorant and they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, and loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand, and they all look to their own way, every one to his gain for his quarter. Now, one of the things that I'm hearing, we may take the whole hour just for me to get through the basic scriptures this morning. I don't know how far I'm going to go. I'm hearing from both people in the pew and people in the pulpit about a lot of the things that are going on in the body of Christ. They no longer judge if it's really of God or not. They judge if it's going to promote their agenda. I mean, you know that maybe your agenda might have gotten a little off and God's trying to do something to bring the whole body back to God. Last year I sat with my pastor and he was, how many know Cleveland, Tennessee actually has a lot of denominations and many, many ministries. So many of them I respect. Uh, Perry Stone has his ministry down there, the Church of God down there, Lee University, done a lot of wonderful things. Uh, even much more influential than what we have in Springfield here. And so he was just longing just to be in the presence of God and to hear good old-fashioned preaching and the anointing and all this stuff. And one minister that he really respected had a, had a conference. They brought in speakers from all over America. He said, I sat and weeped during the whole thing, not because I was blessed, but because the Spirit of God wasn't there. Showmanship beyond belief. Agendas out the kazoo. <laughs> but God wasn't there. It was all about building up their own things. You know, I could write a book today. I could write two books. One on how to get rich biblically and one on how to get right with God. The one that on about getting right with God would sell two or three books. The one on how to get rich would sell millions. Right. We're asleep. Romans. According it is is written, God has given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that they may not that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. So God can those that reject and constantly reject. And Jesus and Paul here was speaking of, of the Jewish people that had rejected Messiah, that just simply couldn't see him in Scripture. God, you know. And sometimes, let me tell you something, if you were determined to go down the wrong path and God tries to correct you and God tries to correct you and you refuse it, he'll just he'll put a spirit of slumber on you and say, if that's the path that you were determined to go, I'm going to let you go down it, but I'm going to give you this big four-wheel drive that you can go over every barrier until you get to the end and maybe before the end you'll wake up and decide you need me. How many, how many of all of us have really set something in motion in our life thinking it was right, and by the end, our prayer was, God save us? In Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time, the time that we're in now, which I think the Apostle Paul was prophetically speaking of, 
that now is the high time to awake out of sleep. He was telling the church in Rome back then, you've fallen asleep spiritually. And he's telling the church now, you have fallen asleep spiritually. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. How many know the Lord's coming back is a whole lot closer than it was when he got saved? Thank God. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot that I want to do in my life. There's a lot that I want, to, I want to see my grandkids accomplish and everything else. But compared to Jesus saying, now I want to come back today. Psh, come on. Why? Because I'll never have to worry about them going through some things. Let's just get her done, get it on to heaven that they can say, you know what? If it hadn't been for the Lord. Yeah. Have every tear wiped away. That's right. I don't know about you, but I, I, I sense it with some of the songs that we were singing this morning. It's just like, where is the elevator button? I'm ready to go. My spirit is ready to go, yeah. but at the same time, I feel this weight because the body of Christ is not ready for what's getting ready to be unleashed in the earth. And the sad part was we were the ones who were supposed to keep it at bay, and because we went to sleep, it rose up. Yeah. Isaiah 52, 1 and 2, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For hence there shall, there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from dust, arise, and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughters of Zion. Now, I know this is talking about when the Lord comes back, but we find here that God is saying, you need to wake up. Yeah. You need to wake up. When you're asleep, you put off your strength. It's going to click here in a minute for some of you. Mark 13, 35 through 37. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you what? Sleep. And what I say unto the what I and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. You got to be watchful. Not only watchful for him, but for watchful for the things the enemy can do to put you to sleep. And sometimes the greatest threat, I'll put it this way. How many of us, after a huge Thanksgiving dinner, that we have eaten as much as we normally eat in a week, you sit down on the couch and your eyes roll back in your head. In great prosperity is the greatest threat to falling asleep. Kids can't sleep at night in places of the world because they're hungry. Lack sometimes can be the best thing that ever happened in your life because it'll wake you up. Now, I know that goes against some preaching on television today, but sometimes the Lord lets you go through some stuff because you need to wake up. How many know that they have those little rumblers on the side of the road that if you get sleepy at night, you go, you go too far? That was one of the best ideas. But when there's a rumbling in your life, it may be because God's trying to wake you up because you're about ready to drive off a cliff. Revelation 16, 15, this is how the Amplified. Behold, I am going to come like a thief, blessed and happy and to be envied. As he who stays awake, to be envied. He who stays awake and who guards his clothes so that he may not be naked and have the shame of being seen exposed. How I many know when the Lord comes, the last thing he wants you to do is to, to be asleep? How I many know this isn't talking about physical sleep? I'm going to drink caffeine all the time so that I'll never sleep. You'll go insane, Jack, because you have to sleep physically. But I, one of the things I pray at night is I say, God, as I sleep, my spirit doesn't have to physically sleep. I ask that you would commune with my spirit as I rest before you. There's actually a lot of things the rabbis teach about that. They teach about when in deep sleep, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, will hover over you and cause healing to flow in your bodies. And, and we're finding out from science it's only during deep sleep that your body activates its repair mode. <laughs> in fact, people that are deprived of sleep for a long, long time will end up with type 2 diabetes because your body can't repair itself and it causes you to be insulin resistant. So it's our spirit man never needs to sleep, but your brain and your body does. 
Now, I'll, what I'm going to be pulling from this morning is, is from, the, from John and, and Paula Sanford. Some Christians have heard of them, some have didn't. This book was written back in the 80s. And what's interesting about the writings, John Sanford is the fa- one of the fathers of the prophetic movement today. His, uh, his writings on the Elijah call was foundational to understanding the office of the prophet. He predates Bill Hammond and a whole bunch of others. He's, he's the great granddaddy, if you will. And so John Sanford is extremely prophetic, and then God calls him and his wife to a counseling ministry. So they're not just sitting down with basic psychology and basic life skills from the Word. They can prophetically see what's going on. And they begin dealing with a lot of people, some of them even pastors that, that had no conscience, that, that could get up and preach the word and then have affair after affair after affair. And, you know, the first thing we want to say is, well, you're not saved. Come to find out they really love God, but there's some of them, they just, they just couldn't get out of that cycle. Some of them, they had no remorse. And God, God began to tell them that their spirits had gone to sleep. And this is a quote out of, out of, out of their book on page 107. It was soon revealed that there are two kinds of slumbering spirits. There are those who have never been drawn forth to life, who early in infancy have fallen asleep and can no longer function. Second, there are those who did receive parental and other nurture and who so were awake and functioning spiritually, but turned away from worship, service, uh, prayer and affection until their spirits fell asleep. And both, the heart has usually hardened as well. And so there, how many of us know that there, there are, well, sometimes we see kids that go from uh, foster home to foster home to foster home, and they never really get the love that you need. Let me, let me tell you something, parents. Your kids need loving. They need loving. They need nurture because your spirits draw from it as well. And if you're deprived of that, it will put their little spirits to sleep, which will cause them not to be able to connect with people and a lot of things when they get older. That's why sometimes we we have people that just can't get connected to stuff. Then we have those just out of of, um, disuse. We lay down our devotion. We lay down our consecration to things of God. You can put your spirit to sleep. But I think there's a third one that has developed since the Sanfords wrote this book. I also believe that there is a third cause, targeted occultic power aimed against the body of Christ to put it to sleep spiritually. And this is not just, oh, Mike, you got this revelation. This is intelligence coming from ministries all across the nation that end up ministering to people coming out of the occult and witchcraft that they target Churches, if and how many know that you know the covenants just don't necessarily just meet out in the woods. That they actually have an office where they do stuff, and they will have a map, and they will have targeted and data on every single church in their area. They will target their weaknesses. They know who the pastors are. They know who the deacons are. They know who their plants and the churches are to find out the weaknesses, so they begin begin doing spells and incantations against the church. The occult have been so braggadocious about this that they have said that every single church in America that's really walking with God, that they have spies among them. Now, why should we consider that so, uh, so amazing when the Apostle Paul says that there were those who spot, come into the church to spot our liberty in the New Testament? And they, they find out what's going on to target. What, what, what's the pastor's weaknesses? What, what's, the, what's the deacon's weaknesses? Who's on the board? And how can we affect the board? Or who can we plant in the church that has enough money to make their way to the board? How many have seen churches go south when the wrong person got on the board? You see, in a lot of churches, the board runs the church and not the pastor. How many know that's out of order? It's out of order. Some churches, they're called deacons. Deacons were supposed to be servants, and instead they run the pastor. Many of them have run the pastor. 
we got to realize that we have been put to sleep. And so this morning, I want to look at the functions of our personal spirit. And this, this is directly out of the Sanford materials. And guys, their stuff is not off the wall. Now, they had, they had to struggle when they first started teaching these things, just like any pioneer does, just like those who began to teach the Hebraic Roots Movement were persecuted. Those that used to teach on being spirit-filled back earlier in the church were persecuted by the, un, the, the, those who did not believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit. But what today, many of their teachings are embedded in every level within Christian counseling. Uh, even Joyce Meyer, her foundational teaching, she drew from the Sanfords. Because all you got to do is go to her very basic teachings when she first started. You can just open up their book and go right through it. And what, what, uh, jo- I think God did something with Joyce Meyer because the faith movement used to completely reject it. I had a friend of mine, Dr. Shirley O'Dell, that used to teach this stuff and get wonderful results down in Tulsa, Oklahoma, down in Broken Arrow. She actually had the son of one of the major faith teachers get up and call her out by name and say, this is not of God. But after Joyce Meyer rose up, that same preacher, without retracting his first statement, got up and preached one of her sermons verbatim. He had actually got a tape and preached one of her sermons on these things. And so what God did is God allowed Joyce Meyer to introduce some things for healing and restoration and the healing of the spirit and the healing of marriages to the faith movement. I want to look at the first one. The first function of your personal spirit is corporate worship. Those whose spirits are awake feel the uplifting presence of the Lord in worship service. They feel his anointing pour over them, and their spirit is touched and filled anew with his. That's a direct quote out of their work. That, have you ever been through churches that just sing and the songs are going through the motions? Their spirits are asleep. The reason that we praise and worship, and, and here's one for you, God does not need your praise and worship. God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need anything that man can give him. But what man needs is to worship him so that his presence can come in and strengthen us and empower us and to renew us. We need the worship service. And one of the signs that your spirit is awake is that your spirit is touched by the presence of God during the worship service, during the praise and the worship, that you walk out of here renewed. If you're bored, you're asleep. Come on. The second function of our personal spirit is to enable the person to have satisfying private devotions. You get in the Word, I tell you what, I can't, I can't help but open this book and it speak to me. When I have my private, and let me tell you something, sometimes devotion sneaks up on you. I remember having church sometimes on the elliptical walker on the treadmill. And every once in a while I had to contain myself when I used to go, when, when uh, Brother, Brother Radhouse used to work for me. And so in, in about 2 o'clock I used to go to the gym and Brother Chuck, I'd be there on the elliptical walker, and I'd have to stop and go, "Woo!" There was dead silence in the gym. <laughs> right, sat there, and I'd start crying. They thought I was sweating. I, I pretend I was white, wiping sweat off my face. Man, it was tears because the presence of God would come. It it, it turned into devotion time. Some you can have that devotion time in your prayer closet. You can have it driving down the road. The word of God comes to life. The praise and worship comes to life. And the devotion is real. Yeah, sure is. But I like what they said here. Satisfying. You're not just going through the motions. Well, I read three chapters in the word this week. Praise his holy name. Yeah, you need to take two pills and call me in the morning, Jack. But it's what? Brother Mike, this is what I saw from the word this week. Look what God showed me. And God connected it here, and God connected it here, and woo! You know, it it did something to me. Yeah, that's right. The word is alive and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword. But you can take a sword and you can beat it on a dead rock, (laughs) and it ain't going to do nothing. You know what I mean? If you're not getting anything from the word, it's because you're asleep. 
Fourth, the third, or third function of our personal spirit is to enable us to hear God. God talks to me all the time. Sometimes through other people, and I can hear his voice in their voice. Sometimes from his word. Sometimes he'll just sit down and say, son, we got to talk. I always know when that happens, I sit down and I fold my hands or I take out my notepad and say, yes, sir, what do I need to fix? He said, why does God do that? Because he loves me. He corrects those that he loves. It's like, I don't want you to get off at all. Sit down, son, I want to talk to you. You'd be surprised how many preachers behind the pulpit have confessed that they have never once heard the voice of God. Justin Cornwell, in his book on, on leadership, he said that we have too many ministers that are out preaching in the valley that have never went up to the mountain and had a burning bush experience. You got to hear for you can declare. Otherwise, all you're going to do is preach doctrine. I mean, no, sound doctrine's good. But you've got to know the one who wrote the doctrine, the one who, who, who told you how to live. You've got you to have this living relationship with him. And we have got to be able to hear the voice of God. The fourth function of, us, of our spirit is inspiration. Quickened people find ideas blossoming in their minds. You know, I, I was at a yeshiva one time. We were talking about the creative force of God, and, and people were saying, I just can't figure out how to move forward, or I can't figure out how to do this or do that. And they got to me, and I said, I fear having more than 45 minutes at a time. And they looked at me like, oh, here's trying. I said, no, in 45 minutes, I can get enough ideas to keep me busy 60 hours a week for the next five years. Because it's just like God just starts showing things and showing things, and that creative force. When you, how many know the Holy Spirit's creative? And when he's moving through your spirit, and guys, one of the reasons why manufacturing has stopped in America and innovation has stopped in America is we everybody's spirits have fallen asleep. The Bible says God will give you witty inventions that no one else can figure out. The solution to the world energy crisis, the world whatever crisis, is a believer that can hear the voice of God and the creative power of God is flowing in his awakened spirit. He can come up with ideas. They'll even have the scientists scratching their heads. I've seen this over the, over the years. There's one guy that has a patent and he, he did, how many of the old-fashioned wood stove? He, God showed him how to change the shape of his, and it was a weird-looking thing, to still cast iron, and even showed him he made a mechanism you could take old newspapers and roll it up, and, and the way that it was bound and the, and the way the dimensions that the, the stove was made, it would burn just like a wood log. But it perfectly radiated the heat 360 degrees around that stove without the need of a fan. And it radiated the heat perfectly throughout the entire room. How many know when there's no power... One of those things would be really handy to have. And he said, what was amazing, because he said, I turned off all the heat in my house and just lit that. He said, he said no matter where I went within, within those rooms, that the heat was uniform, there were no cold spots. And he said, there were also no spots too warm. Inspiration from God. And one of the reasons creativity ceases. Here's an interesting one. How many know that Prior to uh, the Great Awakening in 1900, there was the Great Disappointment and everything was kind of growing stagnant in America before there, there was a Great Awakening around 1900. The Patent Office in America, now with what we know now, you're going to see how ridiculous this is. They were going to shut down the Patent Office in 19, 1899 because they had determined that everything that could have been invented had already been invented. <laughs> And that was the intelligentsia of our government said, nothing, there's nothing left to be invented. That this is, that we have reached the pinnacle of human innovation. Revival broke out, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, just invention after invention after invention. I mean, we didn't even have electricity, and they were deciding that they were going to go ahead and shut down the patent office. I call that being stuck on stupid, but that's just a whole other thing. But see, when revival wanes and God's people's spirit starts going to sleep, innovation stops. 
How many know that we need to have believers today that are, that are, their spirits are awake and God can move and his creativity can flow through them? The fourth function in our personal spirit is to enable us to transcend time. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about being metaphysical. Have you ever seen somebody that were stuck in the pain of the moment and that's all they're at? When your spirit is asleep, you can't look backwards to see anything that you can take joy or hope from, nor can you look forward and see the possibility of any hope or enjoyment in the future. You're stuck in the pain of now because only the spirit can look forward and backward. The soul can't. And so when someone is spiritually asleep and you're trying to minister to them, They're stuck in the pain of now, and until you wake them up, they can't see the possibility of any hope in the future. Let me tell you something. That that serves me well, that that I can see the hope and possibilities of what God wants to do. It motivates me now. I can also see some of the good times, even through all the uh, guys in, in, in my life, Mary and I, we went through some hard times, and some of it we don't like to look back at, but there's still glimpses of some good things that God did. There was still some joy there that we can look at. But, I mean, where we're at now is so much better, and I'm, I have this anticipation that God's just getting started. I mean, I woke up one day, and all of a sudden there was something called a grandbaby. Wonder of wonders. I get so tickled. Kids can say the darndest things. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell on Eli. They were, they were watching the Wheel of Fortune. And uh, this lady comes up and she says, I'm a professional tutor. And he went, oh, she's a farter. <laughs> She was able to make a profession out of that. That means there's hope and income for the rest of us. But just sometimes the way that they see life, Mary and I went to bed chuckling last night. You know, you're about to go to sleep. (laughs) This is the joy that they can bring. And watching them learn, watching them discover, watching them become what God said they can be. And what's, what's interesting about being a grandparent you're not cut down with the burden of providing everything and to keep the, you know, it's like we get to watch that just one step afar and we can actually see more than we did when we were parenting. A lot more, much more enjoyable. But to see that and to see what they're going to become gives, can even give hope there just for me. I, I, I can't wait to see what happens when they get to be teenagers and stuff. And I know I've, I've watched Jonathan as he's, as he's become a teenager and, and just some neat things going on with him. Been praying and fasting because uh, he's got a driver's permit. And... <laughs> Speak watchfulness and alertness over him all the time. He's going to be a good driver. The sixth function of our personal spirit is to enable us to communicate with, uh, commune with and communicate with others. If your spirit's shut down, you can't really communicate. It's more than just soul to soul. It's spirit to spirit. And I've been there where I couldn't connect with people, and the more that I have found that God has made my spirit alive, it brings healing to my soul. Because there was a time in my life that my spirit was asleep. And the more my spirit wakes up, the more healing and restoration comes to my soul. And so we, we need, how many know all these things are very important to function? If this isn't functioning in society, then we begin to break off into fragment. How many know that race wars are coming in America because everybody's spirit is asleep? We think that the color of your skin matters. It doesn't. It's the color of your heart. Do you know there are only two kinds of people on this planet, those that are saved and those that aren't? The color of your skin is one of the most foolish things to fight over. It's like flowers in a a field that's just this display of glory to the creativity of God, them fighting amongst themselves because he's red and I'm purple. 
They're all flowers, aren't they? It's just the majesty of God. One of the things I could have brought up on the slide of evil raising itself, one of the things that came to light this week, we have a gentleman that is in charge, one of the guys in charge of purchasing ammunition by Homeland Security. And how many know they've been purchasing up every piece of ammunition they can find? He has another website that he controls that is to prepare blacks to slaughter all the whites worldwide because there's race wars coming. That, that kind of bothers me when uh, somebody like that has that kind of position within the government. Um, his spirit is asleep. Jesus said that nation will rise up against nation in the last days. In the Greek, that's not like nation like America is going to attack Canada. It is ethnos. Ethnic group will rise up against ethnic group because in our spiritual slumber, we think that the color of our skin makes a difference. It doesn't. If we would communicate, if our spirits were alive... When I travel, what I connect with is the Spirit of God with these people. But it is, I don't care what color, I don't care if they're polka dotted. If they're green polka dotted, I don't care if the Spirit of God is with them. They're family. I can sense kindred spirit. But when your spirit's asleep, you, you just have your little crowd and you just begin to think everybody else is the problem. People aren't your problem, the devil is. The, si- the seventh function of our spirits is to create the glory of marital union. Now, everybody stop. I'm not going to get explicit with this. But just connecting of the body and the soul is not satisfying in itself if their spirits don't touch. The Saffords have an entire book, and I, I think it's an awesome premise. Why do Christians commit adultery? Because somehow or another, the husband and wife, their spirits aren't touching. And if, if, if your spirits aren't communing when you have intimacy, it's going to leave this huge gaping hole, and the devil's going to see to it there's somebody else that you start connecting to. And let me tell you something. You can commit adultery without ever having a physical union. There is emotional adultery that goes on in the workplace the whole time. How many times have heard, well, you know, he has his wife at home, but he has his work wife, the one he always talks to and shares with and, and didn't ever, never share with his wife at home. Your wife needs to be your best friend, absolute best friend. You, you share everything with her or him if you're a woman and you're married. Share everything. Now, sometimes for guys, that's hard because she keeps on talking and I got blood running out my ears. Well, your spirit is asleep. Wake up. It's your best friend talking. Because the real reason why a woman has that function was she was created to be your helpmeet. You got it. You need it. You got to have it. And if it's irritating you, then the party you is asleep. And basically what she's saying is we're not connecting spiritually, so I'm trying to, connect, I'm trying to make up for it in the soul realm. Since you're not connecting, I think I'll throw out 10,000 lines and see if one of them connect. And all the women said, that's right. The eighth function of our personal spirit is to protect us. I, I love this one. Is to protect us from disease and to grant us buoyancy to throw off quickly uh, when we do have an illness. And there's actually scripture behind this. The soul of a man will, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. There's something more powerful than the most potent antibiotic on the universe, and it's your spirit man. When he is functioning the way that he's supposed to, he will enable your flesh to, to throw off a lot of diseases. One of the reasons that diseases are, are and let me tell you something, commutative diseases are on the rise globally. And that is not just speaking of the overuse of antibiotics or our poor diet. It also speaks to the poor spiritual health that we are in. There was a guy named John G. Lake who, who had learned how to flow in the life of God. That he went down to, into, uh, into Africa where the bubonic plague was rampant. 
And so they would have guys, you know, they would go in there in gear and they would have to take shots and all that. His healing teams would go in there with no protection except the life of God. His guys didn't get sick. The, the other teams coming from, from England got sick. And I mean, he had such an impact that during World War I in Africa, they had healing teams for the African armies the same way they had medical teams. And what's amazing is the healing teams had a greater success rate of ministering to wounded soldiers, and, and they lived longer than those that were getting traditional medicine. And so what the scientists came to him and said, what's your secret? What, what, what vaccine? What, what are you? He said, the Holy Ghost. And they, they took a slide that was teeming with bubonic plague, and they looked at the microscope, and I mean, it's just bouncing around doing all that. They set it in his hand. He just sat there for a minute and worshiped God, just for a minute. They took the slide off his hand and put it underneath the microscope, and they were all dead. It's because his spirit was so alive with God that the life of God was flowing through, and it killed those things. I mean, it's more powerful than silver. It's more powerful than whatever other kind of antimicrobial, antibacterial thing. And all those things are good. But let me tell you something. It can't replace the life of God flowing through your spirit, man. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit, what does it do to your bones? Dries them up. You see, as I get older... I need that merry heart functioning like a medicine. Obamacare cannot cover what God can give, nor can it regulate it. And it can't charge for it either. Then I think where we're headed, guys, when, when, when we see what's being, what there, I mean, there are crazy, crazy regulations in this thing. I've not went through over all two, 3,000 pages. I mean, sometimes just reading a page or two when you can extrapolate how it will work in society will absolutely scare the fire out of you. It's like, not only will it collapse the economy, it'll collapse the family, it'll do a lot of things. But if it collapses medical, you know, we're, right now we have the best medical facilities and system in the world. If it collapses and you get a runny nose, where are you going to run? You better learn how to run to Jesus. You better learn how to be awake in your spirit, man, so that your spirit can help flow in the life of God to drive a lot of these things off. How many know this is true? There's a level of God that almost sounds like it's a fable to us because we have been asleep for so long we can't imagine the possibilities of it. Or it's just a select few. God wants it for his whole body. It should be rare when a believer gets sick and they should respond to treatment very quickly if they're walking with God and they're alive in the spirit. The ninth function of our spirit is a good conscience. And here's the cruncher. That works before you do something stupid. Not after. Some guys feel bad about stuff after they do it. And then others only feel bad when they get caught. And it becomes public knowledge what they do. But when you're really walking with God, remember in 1 John it talks about those that have fellowship with him, that the blood of Jesus continually cleanses you of all sin and, and how you're not trying to do, do evil. It's because your spirit can see ahead and says, dude, if you do this, it's going to lose this, 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 and this. You don't want that. Having a good conscience works best in your life to keep you from doing something, not to make you feel bad and convict you after you got it done. If it only convicts you after that you do it, your work, your spirit man is only partially alive and you're operating as an infant in the kingdom of God. When it starts telling you, you don't want that, and here's all the things it's going to set, and, 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 and it keeps you from doing that thing. You're growing. How many know that's good? How many know that we need to be awake? Now, the care of a slumbering spirit. Now, if you did not receive nurture when you were growing up, the only thing that is going to help is a lot of counseling and a lot of nurture from the body of Christ because you've got to be, you've got to be loved to life. But really, when you look at the dynamics of what's going on in the entire body of Christ, that's a small portion. The rest of them, 
that either out of neglect have put themselves to sleep or occultic power has put, it, has put them to sleep. The only thing that is going to work is the exact same thing that we have already read. Let me see if I got the slide for that. I don't. Let me go back here real quick. I didn't tell you to quit playing. I told you to go backwards. Let's go back to a couple of things the Apostle Paul said here. I didn't make enough slides, did I? I'm going to go back to Romans 13 and 1. What Paul was saying in 13 11, and that now knowing the time, it is now high time to wake up out of slumber, that was a prophetic call to wake up. In Isaiah, let me find the right slide here. Awake, awake, put on your strength. That was uttered by a prophet giving forth a prophetic utterance to wake up. And right now what God is saying, he's saying, my people, wake up, wake up, wake up, put on your strength. That's one of the things that we're going to start doing in our praise and worship. We're going to be get, God's going to be getting loosing prophetic unctions, not only here but across the body of Christ, to begin giving a clarion call for God's people to quit playing church and to wake up and to become the church of the living God. It takes that prophetic unction to shake a spirit that is asleep to wake it back up. That's why this morning during the intercession time before we started church, it was, it was a cry for God to wake up every pastor, to wake up every deacon, to wake up every member of the body of Christ, for them to wake up out of slumber. This is going to happen with prayer and fasting and prophetic anointing. It's not going to be one thing. How many have ever had a teenager? Wake up. <laughs> Junior, wake up. <laughs> We had one guy when I was going through basic. They'd flip on the lights. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. And everybody's jumping up and there'll be one dude. I mean, everything going on. And I've seen a drill sergeant stand over the top of the bed. Soldier, I said, get up, get up now, get up. Move it, move it, move it. <laughs> About that time, the bed goes flying in the air. And this guy becomes a tumbling tumbleweed going down <laughs> How I many know only if that happens a couple of times when you hear the clarion call? About the first three days, he went flying through the air. By the fourth day, they turned on the lights and he literally jumped up in the middle of his bed and it stood like this. <laughs> he had learned when the call comes, you answer the call. And what we're going to get ready to see, and I, I don't think this is just here because how I many know that we, we speak things here that deals with a lot of different ministries across the nation. God, the Holy Spirit, the drill sergeant of God, is getting ready to turn on the lights and to do the commands to wake up. And you're going to see some believers that may be going flying through the air after not responding a few times. You know why? He loves them. He loves them. Because if they don't wake up, they're not going to be ready for what's happening. With what's coming, guys, we, we're at a pivotal place for two choices. We either can rise up and be fully awake to stop it before it can get entrenched, just like we did back in the, the ending of the 60s and the 70s, or we're going to sleep while it gets entrenched, and then we're going to have to be awake to be able to survive it. It's one or the other but we're going to have to be awake. I would rather wake up early and drive all the ites out of the promised land. Drive them back into the darkness and then to say, you know what? We learned from the 60s to the 90s and 2000s that, you know, give them 40, 50 years, they're going to try it again. We got to, we got to stay vigilant. We got to be watchful. We can't fall asleep at the helm. And so I think for every one of us, our prayer needs to be, Lord, wake up my spirit fully. Give me some spiritual caffeine, Lord. Wake me up and bring me to life spiritually so that I can function in all nine of these areas. You see, there's nine gifts of the Holy Ghost, there's nine fruit of the Spirit, and there's nine things that your spirit will do in your life when it's awake. And it's time to wake up. 
And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Father, I'll loose an anointing, Father, for every single one of us to begin waking up out of slumber. Father, it is high time. Our salvation is closer than when we first believed. Father, the, the prophetic clock is beginning to speed up, and because it's beginning to speed up, we need to wake up to begin functioning in the earth and to be that bride without, without spot and a wrinkle. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would make a personal project out of every single one of us and every single one that ever watches this on YouTube or gets a DVD, make a personal project on every one of us to wake us up to where we're functioning to our potential in all nine areas. And Father, I ask it in the name of Jesus. And Father, there are those coming into agreement with me right now. And the word says that if two or more come into agreement, it's touching anything that will have what we ask. And Father, we say, so be it now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for